Okay, we are now recording. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the Calvary Chapel Higher Ground School of Ministry. We are still in our module on spiritual warfare, and we're now up to class number four out of six. And this is called Dealing with the Enemy. So let's open up in prayer. And Heavenly Father, just thank you right now. Father, as we're coming to discuss dealing with the enemy and strategies for dealing with the enemy and our power over the enemy, we know this is going to be a topic that's going to create a lot of kickback from Satan and his forces. So in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would bind the powers of Satan. Let him have no power, authority, influence over this class, over those in attendance, over the technology, yes. over the broadcasting, over the message. Father, even now, let your Holy Spirit come upon us. Drain me of myself and let your Holy Spirit be the one that presents this message. Now take this time and use it for your honor and glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week we were doing a topic called Dealing with the Enemy. And we were recognizing the uh, fallen angels. We had a brief discussion on demons and the difference between the two. And we got going and things kept moving and next thing we know we're out of time. So I didn't get a chance to finish that topic. So what I did is I took the PowerPoint that we did not finish last week and I added it to the handout for this oh, week. Awesome. And I went through and did some adjusting to kind of get us back on track. So with that, welcome to the invisible war. Now, this is the spirit world and the spirit war is taking place around us. So I want to accomplish three things with our class. I want to make you aware that there is an invisible war taking place around us. I want to tell you about the different doors that lead into the spirit realm and how you can find yourself deceived and led astray. And then I want to be able to equip you for the spiritual battle. Now, not me equipping you, but the Holy Spirit will be equipping you. So we're in the middle of an invisible war. It's a spiritual war. And God is the creator. And our war is against Satan and his forces. So guess what? Satan is the creation. So God is the creator. Satan is the creation. And therefore, God is going to win every time. It's like you creating this fantastic wonderful chocolate chip cookie <laughs> it may be good you may want it but there is no way that chocolate chip cookie can overcome you you have the power over the chocolate chip cookie and it's not going to last too not going to last too long you're probably going to eat it very quickly and you can do whatever you want to do with your chocolate chip cookie. You can give it away. You can break it up. You can stick it in the fridge till it molds and then, you know, do something. <laughs> and that's the reality. God is the creator. Satan is the creation. And we talk back under the topic of Satan versus God, how Satan's greatest lie is that somehow, some way, he is equal to God. And Hollywood has been very supportive of that deception. Nope. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Greater is God who is living in us than Satan who is in the world. So, if you mention that there is a spiritual war going on, people will look at you funny. And sometimes they will even make fun of you. They will try to shame you into silence. Now, I don't know if this was from last week or if it's in this week's handout. But at uh, one point, Bev and I were taking a class at Cal Baptist College. Cal Baptist College, a Christian college. Although at that time, the president of Cal Baptist decided, no, we're not a Christian college. We are a liberal arts college with a Christian emphasis. So we downgraded it right there. And we were in class, and we mentioned the idea of demons. And the class just basically tried to laugh us out of the room mm. and tried to shame us and tried to humiliate. You can't really believe that, can you? Well, I've had a personal experience I'll mention later in this thing where I did encounter a manifestation. And so, yes, I believe, I know, and I will 
not be shamed into silence. Next thing is, oh, we're one of those nuts with the conspiracy theories. Everybody has a conspiracy theory. So the other side, if they cannot refute you, they will try to shame you. Now, I spent 45 years in workers' compensation. The last 17 was in special investigation unit, dealing with fraud and going to court. So in court, if they cannot refute the evidence you have against them, they cheat. They will try to block the evidence and not let the judge accept it as evidence. And you will find sometimes that the most important piece of evidence you have is blocked for some technicality. You forgot to file a form or you did not disclose it. And you know that if the judge blocks that evidence, you're going down in flames. The nice thing about God's court is they can't play these games. Amen. The evidence will get in. But if they cannot block the evidence, they will try to discredit it. They will try to challenge things. One time I was testifying in court. This was a civil court matter, not the criminal court. I testified in both, but I was testifying as an expert witness in civil court. And I got ready to start my testimony, and my attorney had asked me to explain Labor Code 3600 to the jury. And Labor Code 3600 is the entire basis for the work comp system and how it works. And before I could even say anything, the other side jumped up and, Your Honor, we object. And the judge goes, Okay, what's your objection? We don't believe Dennis is qualified to testify on this matter. Oh my and I'm kind of looking. I've been in claims for like um, 35 years at that point. I have written books and taught classes for 25 years. And it's like, I'm looking kind of like in a disbelief. Mm -hmm. And the judge says, okay, proceed. I say, Mr. Knotts, have you ever gone to a law school? No. Have you taken any classes in law? No. Have you taken the bar? No. Your Honor, we rest our case. He's not qualified <laughs> to discuss the law. It's like you have to have this little secret handshake and know the password to get through. And the judge saw the look on my face that I was just incredulous. They were making that accusation. He says, do you have anything to say? And I says, yeah. No, I haven't taken a class in law. No, I haven't taken the bar. And no, I am not an attorney and don't claim to be an attorney. But I am a college graduate and I am an English major. And this is written in English. <laughs> and I can read the law and understand it. And he said, well, I'll be the judge of that. So I was allowed to testify with the qualifications that if the judge didn't believe I was qualified, he would strike my, my testimony. And so I went through and gave my whole ex explanation and teaching on the Labor Code 3600. And when I got done, he says, okay, let's go. He accepted what I had to say. But they will do anything they can to block it. So they will try to discredit you. So if they can't block the evidence, God put it down in his word. It's recorded. It's tested. It's been proven. They try to discredit those who teach it, so they make fun of your teachers. They try to shame you into silence. And why is that? Well, because the enemy has spent a great deal of time and gone to great efforts to hide in plain sight. The enemy will stand there and he'll literally say, I'm not here. When I was involved in one of my exorcisms, the demons that we were calling out of them would say, oh, we're gone. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, we're not here. No, that's not how it works. So, we believe when Satan says, I'm not here. And I love from 1970, Keith Green, he recorded a song that was entitled, Satan's Boast. And the <laughs> actual message is, no one believes in me anymore. And it's Satan is the character in the, in the song singing these things. And he has one that says, have you heard that God is dead? I made that one up myself, you know. <laughs> and he can do whatever he wants to do because nobody is looking at him. Nobody is aware. Mm -hmm. So with regards to our spirit realm, our world has gone back and forth on the issue. Does the spirit realm really exist? Are there demons? Are there fallen angels? What's going on? So there are times when we become very aware of the spirit realm. We become very aware that there is a war taking place. 
And when that happens, Satan uses this to terrify people. Uh, back in the 1970s, we had this wonderful new movie that came out called The Exorcist. We had another movie that came out, and I hate to admit this, Bev and I saw this on our honeymoon night, <laughs> called The Omen. Yeah. And it was coming out, and we're sitting there going like, wow, they're actually showing what the Bible says about Satan and about him being real and about what he's doing. Well, he did that to frighten people. And everybody became terrified of Satan and of the demons and of the fallen angels for several years. This was happening, and Hollywood was just feeding us over and over, making Satan more terrifying and the demons more powerful. And so people were just, you know, afraid, you know, well, how, how do I know if I'm possessed or not? How does this happen, you know, and how can I fight this? And so he terrified people, and they were terrified of Satan and his forces. And then we always become enlightened. I love that one word, you know, it means that you now have the light. And we're now a world of science. Because we are a scientific world, we have given up on our superstitions. We gave up on our fears, and we refuse to believe that Satan even exists. Even when Satan stands right in front of us and waves his hands and makes faces at us and laughs because we ignore him. It's like the emperor's new clothes. Nobody wants to admit what they are plainly seeing. Which is why in the first class, we went through the idea of the latest theories coming from quantum physics, quantum mechanics, string theory, subatomic particles showing that there is a <coughs> level at the subatomic level where we can leave our dimension and things can leave and things can come back. So we now know that we live in an open universe and not the closed universe the scientists taught for many, many years. Oh, our universe is completely closed. So if God is out there, he can't get in. Really. <laughs> it's his world. He made it. And you may notice from certain situations that when people create certain computer programs, they install a back door. Yes. So they can put, you know, tons and tons of security and passwords and coding in front of it. And he types in one word and he's in the back door running the system. Well, that's God. At the subatomic level, we are an opened universe, and God can always enter the universe. So, that's the thing that we're talking about. But because of our ignorance, and we don't believe Satan is around, he has been free to move his forces freely in the world and into our lives. Right now, he is recruiting his army, Mm -hmm. And many do not even know that they are being recruited. Amen. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Michael Warnke. Anybody heard the name Mike Warnke? Sure. Yeah. Oh, he was more than a comedian. Yes, that was his I ministry. Know, he was that high I, I met him. He was at a youth group. And he, at one point, was the high priest in the Satanic Church yeah. in San Bernardino. Wow. And yeah. he led a thousand people into the satanic church while he was the, the high priest there. And so when he got saved, he promised and vowed to God he wanted to win 1,000 people to Christ for every 1,000 person he had led to Satan. And there were things that happened, and he has the book called The Satan Seller. Mm. And I looked, and he signed it for me. And then he put a ichthus at the bottom of his signature with a little halo. Oh. And he goes, you know what that is? I said, no, nope, that's my holy mackerel. <laughs> and so his ministry he was a Christian comedian but he was very much involved as a consultant for a lot of the uh, law enforcement agencies when they had things happening that looked like they were satanic groups doing things now unfortunately uh, his ministry was for lack of a better word sabotage and destroy I can tell you from personal experience that when you are involved in the occult you have access to things, you find things, you have proof. You can prove to people that this is satanic, you can prove that the demons are there, you can prove that you can do this. Mm -hmm. And the minute you become a Christian, all that evidence is gone. And so he became a Christian and all of the evidence of his background in the satanic church was lost, hidden, mm -hmm. or suppressed. 
so people came after him saying oh nobody can confirm that you were the high priest in satanic church you were lying and they discredited him and his ministry ended if they can't refute you they discredit you that's exactly what they did in his case so no we can't hit our church so Satan has created and placed doors into the spirit realm all around us. Now he's been leading many people through these doors, and these doors are under his control. Now he is very careful. He doesn't throw the door up saying, Hi, I'm Satan, come join me. He's not that crazy. He might be that bold, but he's not that crazy. <laughs> and he will do little things. Now let's say, for example, you're reading your horoscope. I have a, a book that's called The Unofficial Horoscope. It's called You Were Born on a Rotten Day. And it's a parody of horoscopes because you look up this one thing saying, your horoscope for today is, it's a bad day to be hit by a truck. <laughs> like, it was a good day to be hit by a truck. <laughs> and so people will read their horoscope and it says, oh, you're going to meet somebody important today. And they meet somebody important. Oh, you're going to find some money today, and they find money. Oh, you're going to have an opportunity today, and there's an opportunity. And so they start trusting their horoscopes. They start believing their horoscope, and then they start <laughs> modeling their life and making their decisions based upon the horoscope. And it's little breadcrumbs that Satan is tossing out, and you come closer and closer. And the more you come closer, he starts showing more, and he starts showing more, until he's able to reveal what he's trying to do. He does it with the people that go to fortune tellers. He does it with the people that read their horoscopes. He does it with the people that are dabbling in the occult. So, I know people who speak of the church as being forced underground during the rapture. That's the prevailing theory. Uh, everybody's saying the world's going to get worse. We're going to start being overwhelmed. We're going to be forced into an underground church mode. Now, I'm going to challenge that. I think I'm like one of the two people out there saying, <laughs> no, that's not what the Bible says, because I've actually read the Bible. I believe that the underground church is going to be taking place during the tribulation. Now, right now, we have countries where persecution is there, yes. over in Korea and over in China, the church is underground, but I believe our condition is going to change before the rapture takes place. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail over the church. So if we are forced to hide underground until the rapture comes, what we basically are doing is that we're leaving the world in defeat. We're like a dog running with its tail between its legs. And again, that is not how I see the church described in the Bible. So I believe that when the rapture comes, the church is going to be back at its peak. We're going to be in charge. Now, we have the promise to the church of Philadelphia. Now, I did not understand this when I was first doing my studies on the book of Revelation. I was taught that you have the church age made up of the seven churches. And when one church age would end, the church of Ephesus came to an end at the end of the you know, first century church. And then you have the next church, which was the persecuted church. And every church age would end and the next would <coughs> begin. Well, we had a problem because you have the church of Thyatira. The church of Thyatira is the Catholic church. And the Catholic church is still in power. Mm -hmm. Then you have the church of Sardis. And that is the Protestant church. And that church is still existing. Then you have the Church of Philadelphia. And I thought that the Church of Philadelphia had ended. And I was raised being told that we are now in the Church of Laodicea. And that's the church that God spews out of his mouth. That's not a church you want to be a member of. But if you followed the teaching, that was the only church there was. And now, now after doing some more research and coming to some uh, studies, I believe the church of Laodicea is the cult church because that is the church that Jesus is not in. 
And he is outside knocking on the door, trying to bring people out of that church into a personal relation with him. So the church of Philadelphia, the church of Laodicea, the church of Sardis, and the church of Thyatira are running side by side. We have four churches currently up and running. So the church of Philadelphia is still here. The church of Thyatira was threatened to be sent into the Great Tribulation. So Thyatira still is present when the rapture takes place. We see the same thing with Sardis. Church of Philadelphia was the one that was promised to be removed at the rapture. Well, the Church of Philadelphia was given a promise, and that promise was that I will open a door for you that no man can shut. That door, I believe, is going to be the one last great revival. So we are the Church of Philadelphia. We're going to be going in the rapture. And there's going to be one last great revival. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 tells us that the Holy Spirit will restrain the wicked one. And he will continue to restrain the wicked one until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out. So that's the rapture. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 Revelation 3.8 has the opening of the door that no man can shut. In Matthew 24, chapter 24 and 25, says that you're going to have wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. You're going to have false prophets and false teachers, but the end is not yet. And then the gospel shall be preached unto all mankind, and then the end shall come. So I believe there's going to be one last great revival. That was Matthew 4? That was Matthew chapters 24 and 25. They talk about that. So I see our fate as different from being pushed underground and persecuted until the time of the rapture. I see God restraining the wicked one, lifting the church back up into power, giving us the victory, opening the door of revival, and being a massive worldwide revival before the rapture takes place. And at that point, God is going to take us out of the world. And at that point, Satan is going to win by default, not because he prevailed against us, but because we were taken out. So only when the Holy Spirit and the church are removed will Satan come back into power. But that power is only going to last for seven years during the tribulation. And at the end of the tribulation, that's when the real battle is going to take place. And it's not going to be an invisible battle. We're going to actually see the battle of Armageddon. We're going to see Jesus returning. We're going to see the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the forces of Satan gathered at Armageddon. They will literally turn their weapons on him once he's coming out of the sky on the horses with the army behind him. So this is how crazy they really are. So, before this door is open, Satan is going to build his forces and he's going to try to undermine the power of the church. So this is the war that I'm speaking of. This is where we are right now. So we need to be careful that we don't end up on the wrong side. Having said that, let me just caution you. You cannot, you will not, you do not lose your salvation. Salvation is your spiritual birth. And that is when your spirit is born within you. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Once you're born, you can't be unborn. And salvation is a gift. Yes, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By faith, grace are you saved through faith, not of works. It is the gift of God. Romans eleven twenty nine says the gifts, i.e. salvation and other gifts, and the calling of God are irrevocable. They are without repentance. They will never be taken back. Where we get our confusion is that we're mistaking sanctification for salvation. Salvation is your spiritual birth. 
Sanctification is your spiritual growth. Now, <clears throat> salvation is free, it's immediate, and it's permanent. Sanctification, you work for that. Mm -hmm. And you can lose that. You can go up and you can go down. You can go forward and you can go back. It's not a permanent condition. It's something that we have to constantly work at to get there. So I say on the wrong side, I'm not talking about you losing your salvation. I'm talking about you finding yourself supporting the forces of Satan. I have been with Christians. And when we get to certain topics about Christian, and somebody starts talking about abortions, and there are Christians out there who say there's nothing wrong with an abortion. They encourage abortions. You know, they don't have an issue. They look at certain things the Bible plainly speaks against, but the world's theology and the world's philosophy now supports those very things. And so they have shifted from what the Bible teaches to what the world preaches. And they are there. They've gotten onto the wrong side because they've let themselves be influenced. So, how is Satan recruiting? Again, he's subtle, he's deceptive, and he's even recruiting from the church. We've seen pastors that have actually been teaching things from the pulpit that are not according to the Bible, but it is per the agenda that the world is trying to get us to accept. So believers are slipping onto his side without realizing it. Mm -hmm. So how do we end up on the wrong side of this war? Well, there are many paths. I love this picture. It kind of gives you an idea that you know there's always decisions in your life. And if you don't realize it, you're going to come off of the main path. Now up here, we have the main path. This path up here that's coming along the bottom is the main path. And it's a major branch. It's a major decision yeah. that will take you off the main path. But once you're there, notice these paths are a lot smaller. It takes smaller decisions to continue to lead you astray. So here's a few things that can pop up. I mentioned these. You have horoscopes. You have fortune tellers. You have UFOs and people that use Ouija boards. You have people that are involved in the New Age. You have people that are involved <coughs> in cults. People are using drugs or people are involved in hypnosis. You have pornography and you have ghosts. You have the outright occult and you have witchcraft. And you can find yourself without realizing it if you're following a path without paying attention to where you're going or what the Bible is saying, you can find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's going to be my testimony today. I had an interest in UFOs. I like this picture because it's all up in the air. And that's where the UFOs were. They were up in the air. And you can go all over the place yeah. when you're dealing with UFOs. I actually got started with UFOs back in seventh grade. Now, those who know me know that I read and collect comic books. I love science fiction. I can probably quote you most of the episodes from the original Star Trek series. So, I understand it's fictional. And I was reading about flying saucers in my comic books and life on other planets and aliens and ray guns and, yeah. And I get to seventh grade and I have a science teacher who's doing the science fair class, and he's saying, you need to look into the UFOs because they're real. And I'm like, what? And he had magazines with pictures of UFOs. And I'm going like, no way. And so this got me started. And so I started going into the UFOs. I started tracking down these strange bookstores. You can't could not buy these in regular bookstores back in the 60s. There were these strange, off the beaten path, back in the back alley bookstores, used bookstores, and they'd have magazines, they would have books on UFOs, they have other strange <coughs> out there. If you ever saw Shirley MacLaine doing uh, Out on a Limb, and her story of how she got involved into the New Age, 
you know, those are the kind of bookstores that I went to that she was in at the same time. And so as you're doing this, you start doing UFOs. Well, Simi Valley is a hotbed for supernatural activity, most of it satanic. Simi means valley of the winds, and in the native language, it meant valley of the spirits. And when we lived in Simi Valley, when Bev and I went back to Simi Valley, there was very strong satanic, demonic activity taking place there. So I was in Simi Valley, good place to start. We had UFO flaps. That is a term for the UFOologists, where there was a sudden appearance of multiple UFO sightings in the neighborhood. And our local newspaper covered the UFO flaps. Uh, one gentleman was coming down the 118 out of the Box Canyon, the, uh, the pass, as we referred to it back then before they put the freeway in. And he saw a UFO had landed off the side down in this field and he got out of the car walked <coughs> over and there was a UFO there and there was an alien that came out and started sharing things with him. <coughs> the stuff that was being shared yes. did not correspond with what the Bible was saying. <coughs> you know, their type idea of how the world was created, how the universe worked, and they did not have God, they had something else that was guiding them. And if you listen to the UFOs, you believe their theories, you're going to find yourself sitting right in the middle of what we now call the New Age Movement. I was part of the New Age Movement before it even had a title mm. because of this type of stuff. Well, you can't track down UFOs, they have to come to you. So that led to trying to find other types of unexplained phenomena. My entire ninth grade, I was going to a friend's house after junior high, after class, and we practiced for two or three hours a day trying to open our mind to this supernatural world, how to do the astral projection, how to do mind reading, how to receive messages from other planets and other worlds. And we, we went through all kinds of exercises trying to strip away the things that God had placed there to protect us. Also got involved in going to haunted houses. I could show you all the haunted houses and there were several houses that we had gone to in the middle of the night and we had heard the voices and we had seen the things moving. Uh, I actually went to a cemetery several times at midnight and spent the night in the cemetery trying to track things down and trying to see things and this eventually led to witchcraft. Now, at that point I had bought, strictly for research, a satanic bible. And in the back of the satanic bible there was a whole set of spells that you could practice and you could cast. And it was everything from how to basically become a werewolf to how to control people, you know, and how to speak with the dead. So this was all part of my research that I was involved in. Now I was still attending church at the time. And there was a certain Bible verse that I was living by. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. And it says, all things are lawful. And so, yes, all things are lawful because when you stand for, I don't want to use the word judgment, but when there's an accounting after your life is over, for the non-believer, you're over here at the great white throne judgment. You're being judged by the law of Moses, and yes, if you've broken the law, you're in serious trouble. You're going to be found guilty. Over here for the believer is the Bema seat, and we personally are not being judged. The law of Moses is not the standard they are judging us by they are judging our works and we can lose we can suffer loss of our rewards but we ourselves are not lost is how Paul refers to that so I was living under this one section saying all things are lawful okay this is great I can do this I can you know, read the Satanic Bible. I can go to the graveyard with black candles at midnight. I can go into haunted houses. And as long as I stayed close to God, I felt I'm safe. 
Not a problem. Well, Satan kept me away from the second part of that verse. Not all things are expedient. In other words, not all things are good for you. And so I was being influenced in ways that I had not yet realized because I was so focused on what I was going after. Again, I was involved in the New Age movement before the New Age movement even had a name, before Shirley MacLaine even got involved in it or knew about it. All of my choices and all of my decisions continued to open me up more and more to the spirit realm. I had evidence of the spirit realm. I had evidence of demons. I had evidence of all these supernatural things that were taking place. Just like Mike Warnke, he had all this evidence that led him to become the high priest of the Satanic Church of San Bernardino. Then, one night, I had an encounter. I was sleeping on the couch in my parents' living room. And in the corner of my parents' house, there was this shadow over the clo uh, closet in the living room. My parents leave the windows open, there's a street light, Living was always kind of lit all night long, but over in the corner is the shadow. Well, I'm laying on the couch and I'm looking and the shadow is getting darker and darker and darker. And then I realize it's not just getting darker, it's getting closer and closer and closer. And at that point it was between me and the coffee table. I could no longer see the coffee table. There was that shadow. And then two red eyes opened in the shadow. And I heard this voice offering me a deal if I would give up my faith. I could have anything I wanted. Mm -hmm. Was I freaked out? Yes. And I realized, no, it's all a lie. Give up your faith and what do you have left? You know, you can have wealth, you can have power, you can have fame, you can have wine, women, and song, but you don't have God, you don't have peace. So, I grabbed everything I had, I went out into the backyard, and we had a side yard, and my dad had his barbecue grill there, and I started throwing things into the barbecue grill. I started with the Satanic Bible, and I doused it in light of fluid, and I tossed it into the barbecue grill, and I threw the match in, and flames everywhere. And then the flames died down, and the Satanic Bible was untouched. It freaked me out even more. I started grabbing all my magazines, all of my books, all of my research, all of my theories, and started throwing them in and lit those, and they all started burning, and it all started burning. And finally, when the last piece of my research burned, the Satanic Bible caught fire, but not until. And it burned so hot that it burned and scorched the grass under the barbecue grill and nothing would grow there for over a year. My dad kept saying, what happened to my lawn? <laughs> I don't know, Dad. I can't explain it. <clears throat> so, I will tell you now that there are certain things I cannot do. There are certain movies and shows and books I cannot read or watch. There are certain things I cannot discuss mm -hmm. because if I do, I open that door again. Did fact, your parents know that you were into all that? They knew I was talking about UFOs and I had all this yeah, stuff. But it seriously like you were. They never paid attention to me. Oh. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I was about eight years old and I went up into the woods by our house and I got lost and was gone for three days and two nights and they didn't know it. My dog came and found me and he led me home and I came back and they didn't know I'd been gone. Mm -hmm. So, oh. now, having said that, let me have a quick prayer because I don't want to open the door. For Satan in this meeting. Okay. Heavenly mm -hmm. Father, I just pray for your divine protection. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you would bind the powers of Satan. Father, I need to share things, and these things can open the door for the enemy to come in and to influence us. So, Father, please bind the powers of the enemy. Give us your divine protection. Put a hedge of protection around us. Mm -hmm. And, Father, for those that are watching this online, Father, I pray that even they would have that divine protection that you would bind the enemy in their lives and that they could not be influenced because of the things that we are talking about and sharing in this lesson. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, 
there is always a price you're going to pay when you get involved in the occult. So Satan made a serious mistake in my case. I don't think Satan makes mistakes, but it looks that way to me. He had kept revealing himself to me over and over and luring me further and further in and showing me more and more supernatural activity before he made his offer. When they made the offer, I realized that if Satan was real and the supernatural was real, so was God and so was the Bible. And God used that to increase my faith. Mm -hmm. I do not recommend that as your path for spiritual growth. It was not a good place to go. So I rejected the offer. And as I said, the very next day, all the evidence, all the proof that led me to accept Satan in the spirit realm was gone. If somebody had asked me to prove any one of the things I had been telling them, it was gone. The haunted houses were no longer haunted. The places I went that we could see things and feel things and I could do things was gone. So, before moving on, let me touch briefly on the UFOs because this is what lured me in. Even after my visitation, I still wanted to believe in UFOs. It was a passion with me. So, I would tell myself this wonderful lie. <clears throat> there are worlds that did not fall into sin out there. They're inhabited. They had their garden of Eden. They did not eat the forbidden fruit. So as a result, they did not fall. And as a result, they are so far ahead of us technologically, they can travel from planet to planet and go faster than the speed of light and anything else you want. Well, I was in college when a gentleman made a comment. He quoted a simple verse to me from Romans 8. All creation groans under the curse. What? All creation? He was paraphrasing Romans 8.22. So, all creation groans under the curse, he told me. That would include all these other worlds out there. And when I thought that they were unfallen and more advanced, if all creation is groaning under the curse, then those other planets and those other worlds are also under the curse. Well, Dr. Martin was teaching on UFOs at the time, and what he was teaching is that they were demonic deceptions. And how that, you know, Satan is trying to deceive us into thinking there is life on other worlds. And if you look at what they are teaching, it's teaching us something other than God as the explanation for our universe. Well, Chuck Missler, he left Dr. Martin in the dust. He left me in the dust. I mean, his research is like over the head. I got to watch him three times to figure out the basics. And he did an entire thing called Alien Encounters. And I love the fact he taught this at Roswell. <laughs> And Roswell was the UFO capital of the world. That's where the spaceship apparently crashed and the alien bodies were found and they can prove all these things and things like that. He also taught it during a major anniversary at Roswell and all the UFO fanatics were there. So he pointed out that UFOs violated the laws of physics. Quick example, you can't be going along and then do a 90 mile an hour, 90 degree turn at you know, Mach 3, because when you're going this way and your ship goes that way, inertia keeps sending you this way, and you will plow into the side of your ship into a big smush, big mess. The only way they could change course that quickly, fly that fast, and not crash into things is they had to be blinking in and blinking out of our universe. And that was a key point that came to things. So they were not ETs or extraterrestrials. They are what I refer to as EDs or extra dimensional beings. Mm -hmm. In other words, these are fallen angels yeah. and <clears throat> demons. So every time somebody spoke to them, they were given a different version of the universe without God and without Jesus. They never spoke of God. Their plan of salvation was completely different. And they were Satan's deception in a different form. They literally began to endorse all the teachings of the New Age movement. And Dr. Chuck Missler did an excellent job putting this together in his uh, 
DVDs. So if you really want a deep, in-depth study, if you still have some questions about the UFOs, these are the source that I would send you to. I think you can even find these on YouTube. So if you can't afford to buy them, you can pull them up and watch them there. Yeah, he's there. But you have the New Age movement teaching that we are our own God. You know, they even explain the rapture because they teach that Mother Earth is its own entity, it is its own life form. And that at some point, Mother Earth is going to get tired of these Christians who are so unreasonable and won't accept the New Age doctrines of tolerance. And so Mother Earth is going to expel them from her in an instant. Cool. So one moment all the Christians will be on Earth, and according to the New Age doctrine, we're going to suddenly just disappear. Either UFOs will show up with aliens and they'll abduct us away to a new planet to be rehabilitated, or we will just basically be cast out and end up somewhere else where we have to change our way of thinking if we want to come back. Amazing how Satan's already planned the deception for the New Age and the rapture. There was a group in South Korea that they were working with alien abductees, people who claimed they were taken by aliens. Normally they're taken by aliens, normally they are molested and given medical exams. Now, it was never a one-time thing. People thought they had just been abducted once but when they started doing therapy and they were doing hypnosis to uh, bring back uh, lost memories, <clears throat> they found that each of these people had been abducted and been molested for most of their life <clears throat> since they were very young children. So they were treating one man, and this man had a problem that over and over the aliens would show up in his house, they would paralyze him, and they would begin to torment and molest him. One of the times when he was paralyzed, he suddenly remembered something his grandmother had said. And mustering what little strength he had, he cried out, In the name of Jesus, save me! Guess what happened? The aliens screamed and fled the room. They left the house. Whenever they came back, if he would cry this out, they would leave him alone. They were not aliens, they were forces of the supernatural realm. So the group in South Korea began using this information to treat the victims of alien abductions. And they were very successful, and the alien abductions were no longer happening to them. Now, Dr. Missler talks about there's one account, and only one account, of any Christian ever being confronted or abducted by an alien from a UFO. And in that account, the only reason it happened was because she personally invited them in. As believers, we have protection from that. So, there are things that God did in order to use what I have learned as part of my rehabilitation process. I became involved in three exorcisms. Now let me qualify that word. There are some people that take offense at that word. Exorcism is a practice of the Catholic Church. And it describes the process of taking somebody who is demonically <coughs> possessed and casting the demons out of it. Some people are more comfortable if I use the word casting out. So instead of three exorcisms, I cast out demons on three occasions. Now, I do not claim to be part of the Catholic Church. I do not claim to be the priest designed for the exorcism in the Catholic Church. You must be authorized and trained by the Catholic Church to do the exorcism. And we had a very interesting discussion in our staff meeting where I mentioned this about who is authorized or who is empowered to do the casting out. Uh, Jesus gave his disciples the authority to cast out demons. Now, I personally believe that God will give any believer the power to cast out any demon if God brings that person into their presence. I do not 
to the home audience. I do not recommend, suggest, or encourage you go looking for demon-possessed people. It is not safe. It can be very dangerous. And unless this is something that God has brought you to do, count yourself lucky that you are not involved. Now, each of these three times I ended up, quote, casting out demons, I was not looking for demons. I did not suspect demons. The first time was a girl that I was with her and she suddenly started freaking out and screaming and grabbing and throwing things and breaking things. And I didn't know what else to do. And I yelled, in the name of Jesus, stop. And she stopped. And I'm like, what? And so I began to pray and share. And she became a Christian and the demons were gone. Not a big deal. Right. Second time, I didn't know we were doing it. We had this one person who, every time he came over, he would basically contradict everything the Bible was teaching us. Everything we were taught about how to battle the enemy, it didn't work. So I'm sitting with my roommate in our dorm room, and I says, "Do you think Satan's doing this, trying to get us, you know, discouraged?" He goes, "Possibly." So we prayed for God to bind the demons. <coughs> and I don't know why I use the word cast them out, but I just use that as part of the binding the demons. And to, you know, let the Holy Spirit just take over and, and you know, bring him out of this. Well, two days later, he came over and he was talking about stuff and we mentioned the rapture and he says, yeah, I'm going to go in the rapture. And we go, no, you're not. You're not saved. He goes, yeah, I am. What do you mean you're saved? Well, I got saved. When? Two nights ago. When? Right when I was praying. And for some reason, he felt this thing leave him. His eyes were suddenly open. It all made sense, and he asked Jesus to save him. That was a long distance exorcism or casting out for the home audience. Hmm. The third one was not successful. This is because that person did not want to be delivered of his demons. But even in that case, I was not looking for demons. I was not thinking demons. He claimed that he was the new replacement for Billy Graham, and that's why he was at Cal Baptist. He was our next door neighbor in the men's room, in the men's dorm. And if you go to Cal Baptist and you start asking about, quote, an exorcism, you'll start hearing the new urban legend that has grown since the 1970s. And they have doors opening and closing on their own, Bibles floating down the hallway and everything else going on. Uh, he was the new Billy Graham. He was in the ministerial program. And he started having trouble because some of the men in the men's dorm, when they went to Disneyland, were out dancing at Disneyland. How dare they? You know, that's sinful. We need to report them to the administration. We need to have them expelled. He had no grace. He had no mercy. When he would stand in his room all night long preaching to the walls, it was all condemnation, judgment, damnation. You're going to burn in hell without any mention of Jesus or grace or mercy or forgiveness. And I started discussing him the difference between what is denominationally unacceptable, what is socially unacceptable, and what is biblically unacceptable. And he started pressing the image, pressing the point. Well, what about smoking? What about drinking? What about this? What about that? And when I finally said concerning drugs, no, drugs are definitely you don't want to go there because that is how demons get involved. And the sorcerers of the Old Testament, the word sorcerer comes from the word pharmakia, and the sorcerers would use drugs to open their minds to the demonic realm. So he then became obsessed with drugs. He was tempted by drugs. He wanted to try drugs. And so one day I says, okay, that's Satan talking to you. You know, let's pray. And so when I started praying, he's going, oh, I'm thirsty. I need to get a drink. Okay. He went to get a drink downstairs. Comes back. Okay, let me pray for you now. Oh man, I am really thirsty. I need to get another drink. And about the fourth time, I says, Look, we've got water right here in the fridge. I'll give you a drink. 
no, no, I, I need the water downstairs. I figured he's just uncomfortable. He says, okay, you go get your water. I'm going to pray while you're gone. And while I'm gone, God's going to hear, even though you're not here. And so he left, and I knelt down by the bed, and I started to pray. And within 30 seconds, he was back in the room. What are you doing? I'm thinking, isn't it obvious? I'm praying. I said, I was praying. He said, you're praying for me, aren't you? I'm thinking, Lord, what's going on? He goes, stop it. And he put his hand on me to push me. The minute he put his hands on me, I felt something leaving his body, trying to enter mine. And at the same moment, I felt the Holy Spirit swell up, fill me, and push it out. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped praying for him. I was praying for me. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, there's nobody there. You know, there is no God. Why are you praying? I'm thinking, this is the Billy Graham replacement. And then he started getting crazy. And he started breaking things. And he started trashing the room. And he threatened to jump out the window. And I was praying for God, don't let him mm -hmm. jump out the window. And then he threw his head back and spoke in five voices at once. At that point, I realized I was dealing with demons. And we had tried an exorcism that night. We thought it was successful. It was not because he did not want the demons to leave. And I learned a lot of stuff through that failed exorcism. And I'll be discussing this when we go forward. Now, Demons and fallen angels are not the same things. Fallen angels have spiritual bodies. But when we talk about demons, they are described as disembodied spirits. In other words, they have no bodies. They had a body at one time. That's what disembodied means. And they no longer have their body. The demons lost their bodies long ago. And... I believe, for lack of a better description, these demons were the souls or the spirits of the Nephilim, those who were the result of fallen angels joining with, with women, marrying and producing the Nephilim, the giants. And they were not pure human anymore. So when they died, they could not go into the bosom of Abraham because their soul was not human. And the bosom of Abraham was reserved for the human souls. They could not go into Sheol because that was reserved for humans. So they had no place to go at the point in time of their death. And that's why they are disembodied and moving throughout the world <clears throat> trying to find something. They try to seek bodies that they can inhabit because our physical body is a biological machine that allows our spirit and soul to interact with this world. It's a separate dimension. Now, when Jesus was casting out demons during his time on earth, he was sending them into a place called the abyss. Now, because we no longer believe in demons or the spirit realms, nobody is confronting them. And there was a major discussion we needed to have about the fact that people mistakenly will look at somebody that has a mental problem, has a chemical imbalance, and go, oh, they've got a demon. No. So don't go looking for demon-possessed people. Don't go confronting demon-possessed people. If God wants you to deal with a demon-possessed person, he will bring that person to you and he will eventually reveal things that will tell you that this person is demonically possessed. So one of the things I'm going to be talking about is the fact that, like a red flag, demons have been with us our entire life. They are immortal and they are invisible. And there's probably several in this room that we've prayed over and they, they've tried to slip back in. They know what's happening. They see what we're doing. Can they read our minds? No. They can read our body language and what our body is doing and figure out, oh, he's hungry. Oh, he's bored. Oh, he's interested in this. And they can react to that, but they cannot read 
in your mind. So if we are doing a spiritual cleansing, again, I encourage you to pray out loud because they cannot hear our thoughts. But they can hear our voices. So we're going to do some stuff on spiritual warfare, and I'm going to call this my spiritual boot camp and give you basics. Again, I can't say this enough. Don't go looking for these things. You're not qualified to confront any demon on your own. If you try, you're going to fail every time. And if you ever encountered a true demonic supernatural event, I suspect you probably will never want to go back there again. After my last encounter, I have done everything I can to avoid those type of spiritual confrontations. So, unfortunately, we have retreated too far, and this is why I mentioned before that we were at the Christian college and I mentioned demons, and they tried to laugh us out of the room. They did not believe in the demons, the angels, fallen angels, or even the devil. They reluctantly believed in the Holy Spirit because that was part of the Trinity. But they ignored all the other passages dealing with all the other supernatural beings because they were enlightened. Is that fun? So if you don't believe in the supernatural, you're not going to be paying attention to these things, and these things are going to be happening all the time around you, and you're going to just explain them away. The rabbis have an interesting concept. They say, Coincidence is not a kosher word. Remember Fred Palacios way back when? Mm -hmm. That was his favorite expression, you know. Coincidence is not a kosher word. It's not in the Hebrew language. There were no coincidences as far as the rabbis were concerned. It was evidence that God was working in your life. So, things happen and we say, oh, that's just a coincidence. So if you ignore the enemy, you don't believe in the enemy, you won't try to resist the enemy, you won't do anything to protect yourself, and the enemy is now free to do as much as he can to torment you, mess you up, lead you astray, and make your life miserable. <coughs> Believers cannot be possessed. I can't stress that enough. And we have people that claim they have what's called a delivery ministry. I will believe that if you are casting demons out of somebody who is unsaved. But too many people in the delivery ministry are casting demons out of believers. That is not possible because there are no demons in believers. And I've seen the crazy stuff. Uh, sometimes they have people coughing into a handkerchief. And then they have the demon in the handkerchief and they roll it up and they throw it into the fire. Oh, we got rid of the demon. No, no, we didn't. That is not what the Bible teaches. I had somebody trying to convince me that there was demonic possession and people that I knew that I knew were Christian. And I was like, no, that is not possible. And we kind of went to blows over. Well, we didn't fight, but we, we argued back and forth. And so it's like, well, I believe they can. I says, well, believe what you want. That's not what the Bible teaches, and I'm not going to endorse that. So, believers cannot be possessed. If you are a believer, you cannot be possessed. The one thing I would encourage is to make sure that you're a believer. Did you, Amen. at some point in your life, personally ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior? That is the transition. That is the spiritual birth. That is when you become a believer. Now, in my case, I thought I was getting saved. I went forward at church at eight years old and told the pastor, I want to get saved. And they set me down on the front pew and they had me fill out a card with who I was and where I lived. They introduced me to the church. They baptized me that night but nobody ever led me in the prayer asking Jesus to forgive me and to be my Savior. Hmm. For 10 years, I thought I was saved. Okay. And it was a Southern Baptist church back in Maryland. Okay. And I was raised in the church. I became a terror 
in the church because somebody said one time, well, if you don't know the books of the Bible in order, you're going to hell. <laughs> I panicked. So I started learning the books of the Bible in order, oh, except for the minor prophets. I'm still working on that one, Lord. Give me a few more days. <laughs> and heaven help the poor Sunday school teacher who did not study his or her lesson. Because I would have them for lunch. Because I had studied the Bible. I knew the Bible. I was really good at the Bible. And they found out the hard way. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you. He does not sublet to anybody. So Satan cannot get in. And I will personally testify, as I mentioned, when the demon-possessed person put his hands on me, there was an attempt for the demons to enter my body. And the Holy Spirit push them out believers cannot be possessed you can be what is called oppressed and that's when you have more demons hanging around you than you thought possible they are bringing attacks upon you they are tormenting you they are deceiving you they are frustrating you they are tempting you but remember this promise 1 John Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You do have power to overcome the enemy in Jesus' name. And you have the protection through the shed blood of Jesus. Now, with the gentleman who did not want to give up his demons, he was still my next door neighbor. And he would come into the room and he would start saying things and making accusations and trying to create problems. And finally, I got to the point where he says, okay, this is it. He says, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and you are not allowed in my room ever again. So he would stand in the hallway and yell these things into my room. He could not physically enter my room. There were people that thought, oh, this is fun. We have a demon-possessed person on campus. Mm -hmm. And they would come up and try to do things and stuff like that. And one guy came in and tried to, you know, attack the demon and challenge the demon and kind of, you know, over the demon type of stuff. And the demon just started saying, so what are you doing in your room when nobody's around? What about this? What about that? What about this magazine you got hidden? What about that you got? And just totally revealed every secret sin the guy had. Mm -hmm and humiliated him and embarrassed him and he went running back to his room and closed the doors and we didn't see him for like two or three days. Mm. It is not safe <clears throat> to confront <throat> demons in your own power. I cannot stress that enough. Through the battle power of the shed blood of Jesus, yes, you can. But I would only recommend that if God is putting you in that place and leading you to do this. So we're going to teach you how to fight some of these spiritual battles. And again, I've been telling ghost stories. I don't like telling the ghost stories. It's not good. I'm only going to comment on something in my life if it's necessary to illustrate a point. So if I'm telling you a ghost story, I end up making Satan sound exciting. He sounds real. He sounds powerful. And if you're a weak person, you may fall for his Deception. You may decide to get interested in him and what he is offering. So, we're going to go through what has been going on in the Bible. The Bible teaches us what we need to know about Satan, about his spiritual forces, and how to do battle. So it is safe for us to study the Bible. Like Perseus of the Greek mythology, he was going up against Medusa. I hate to think I have to explain that, but there's a lot of people now that they don't teach classical mythology. Medusa was a woman that had snakes for her hair, and if you looked upon her, you would turn to stone. So Perseus was sent to kill her, and the only way he could defeat her was he had a shield that the inside was a mirror. And he used the mirror to see where she was, and he killed her by using the mirror without ever looking at her. So, in this situation, the Bible is our mirror. It is a spiritual mirror that reflects many things. And when we look at things through the Bible's mirror, it is safe, and it does not give the enemy power over us. So, this is the first rule of spiritual warfare. Never confront the enemy. 
Now that you've made yourself aware of the enemy and the warfare, you will need this rule to keep yourself safe. Never confront the enemy directly. And they have people that in some of these charismatic churches say, oh, let's call the let's call Satan names. Let's yell at him. Let's insult him. Let's get in his face. You are asking for trouble. Yes. You <clears throat> do not confront the enemy. You never make contact with the enemy and you do not speak to the enemy the closest I would ever suggest is that when you say in the name of Jesus Christ be bound in the name of Jesus Christ God rebuke you Amen. Yeah. leave it at that level don't get in a conversation don't start asking what they've been doing lately don't invite them over to the house to watch a movie do not have any more contact with them than you really have to. We follow the example of the Mar uh, Michael the Archangel. <clears throat> he was battling with Satan in the book of Jude. He did not confront Satan. It says that he did not even bring a railing accusation against him. Instead, he called upon God to do the battle for him. And he said, the Lord rebuke you. You always let God do the fighting for you. So if you want to re improve your relationships, you need to prepare yourself for a spiritual battle. That means you have to become closer to God. The heart of the enemy is going to be fighting you. You need to keep God close because they will try to keep you away from God. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You wonder why the government is so corrupt? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. In the book of Daniel, we discovered that when Gabriel was coming to give Daniel a message, he encountered, quote, the prince of Persia. That is the demon mm -hmm. behind the power of the kingdom of Persia. And he struggled with that until Michael came to help de deliver him. He was going back and there was going to be a battle with the prince of Greece. The next empire that was coming, Satan was <coughs> building his power. So I believe that there are princes <coughs> over the United States, over California and Sacramento, over Washington DC and these are the spiritual wickedness in high places they are influencing our leaders throughout the world our leaders don't recognize the source and they listen and they comply Hitler was believed to be demonically possessed he was obviously being guided by mm -hmm. demonic forces to do the things that he did so God's solution Weaponize your prayers. This is a quick preview of next week, or week after next. We're going to be dealing with the unknown weapons, the weapon of prayer and the weapon of praise. So it's not Santa Claus, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's not a wish list. You know, I want the Porsche Lord. I want to win the lottery. Prayer is how we fight the enemy. Prayers are our weapons in this war. Jesus taught us to pray. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer changes our attitude so that we are in compliance with God's attitude. We should always want what God wants. And I mentioned this over and over and over again that our faith is not a club that we beat God into submission to our will with. We submit to God's will. We should always be praying, your will be done. And then my recommendation is that you pray the second most important prayer. Lord, give me the strength to accept your will. That should be the basis and foundation for your entire prayer life. We need to conform to God's will. <clears throat> this is why prayer is so important. It's our weapon in the war with the enemy. It is our calling upon God to act in our ward, in our war, world, 
and it's empowering God so that he can empower us. <coughs> if we do not submit to God, if we do not open up to God, God cannot use us the way that he wants. So when you become a prayer warrior, you're going to be involved in the spirit world war going on all around you. So I'm going to be doing more discussion about the power of prayer and how to become a prayer warrior week after, uh, probably after the break. It'll be the last class we'll be talking about this. The first priority is going to be focusing on you and your relationship with Jesus. I recommend the first thing you do is to spiritually cleanse your home and protect your base of operations. Now, some people get upset about this saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I don't need to cleanse my home. Yes, you do. There are different things that can happen. The enemy will continue to disrupt and deceive you wherever you can. And if they have a foothold in your house, they will use it. And you can remain ignorant of the war, or you can take an active part in this war. Satan's forces are subtle, and as you grow as a believer, you become more of a target for them. They will try to frustrate you, discourage you from serving God. They can't get you back. You can't lose your salvation. So they will do everything they can to make you ineffective. They want to keep you on the sidelines. And so if they can gain access to your home, they will. So you need to be aware of any clues that they may already have gotten into your home. When Bev and I first got married, we moved into a low-rent apartment complex back in Simi Valley. Mm -hmm. We got married on a Sunday and moved in. Within a week, we were talking divorce. What? Yeah. How did I go from I love you to I want a divorce in just one week? Well, we checked around and everyone in that apartment complex was either divorced or having major <coughs> marital <coughs> problems. It's a very strong area of supernatural activity. And in fact, we discovered the guy across the walkway, we could look into his living room and he could look into ours. They were conducting black mass in that apartment. We saw them running back and forth several times naked. When they moved out, the apartment manager says, they cut a section of the carpet out in the hallway, down to the top. They were painting stuff all over it. I don't understand what that was. That was black mass. They were calling the demons. Mm. So we went through our apartment and we gave everything in our apartment to God. We cleansed our apartment spiritually and then the stress and the frustration disappeared and hey, we fell back in love again. How strong was the demonic influence in our apartment even though we were believers? That has a strange gift. And while we were praying, Bev heard an audible voice that I did not hear. And the voice said, don't pray for the closet. That way, if you want to get away from him, you can go in there. So Bev said, did you hear that? And I said, hear what? The voice. No, I didn't hear a voice. And she told me, so we prayed for the closet twice. Our neighbors asked us to pray for their apartment. I went in and did, but nothing happened. They didn't get the peace. They didn't get the relief that we had. He had to be the one to pray for the apartment since he was the one who was renting the apartment. Satan is a legalist and he will use any legal loophole that he can. So we went through again and this time I led him in how to pray. He did the prayer himself, he and his wife, and this time the prayers worked and they had peace in their apartment. You cannot have authority over someone else's home. When they bring in the priest to pray for a house and to bless the house. It is a temporary fix because as soon as the priest leaves, so does the protection, so does the blessing. You have to pray for your own home. So if you're going to do this, you need to either one, have the legal or spiritual authority over the property. You need to pray out loud and use the name of Jesus. And again, don't use sage, don't use holy water, and don't use crosses or crucifixes. When you watch The Exorcist at the movies, this is all the stuff they do. They sprinkle the holy water 
Other people burn sage in their house to drive out the demons or they place a cross on somebody. These are all the stuff that Satan wants you to trust. Trust the holy water. Trust the <coughs> crucifix. Trust the sage instead of trusting God. <coughs> Those are all outward manifestations. They are rituals that are used in non-Christian ceremonies. They're for show. And Satan lets you think they're working until you leave and then he's right back <coughs> here again. If you're a couple, you need to pray together as a couple. If you're a family, you make it a family activity. When you're done, you do an all-inclusive prayer in case you might have missed something. So be aware, there's more than one way Satan can enter your house. And here's a picture of the guy with the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, and he's fighting the powers of Satan at the doorstep. It's not getting in. Look at the kid on the floor behind him with the iPad on the internet, opening themselves up to demonic influence and sedition. Red flags to watch out for. If you find yourself getting very frustrated over something that is a small thing, oh look, you spilt the water, and you go into a rage and start smashing stuff in the house. If you have irritation, over some unimportant event. You have a sudden anger and you overreact to something. If you keep struggling with depression, some additional red flags, <coughs> you have negative feelings that you just can't explain. You're always feeling depressed, you're feeling negative. If you start to have a lack of any interest in spiritual things, you're having excessive temptations of something you're struggling with and no matter what you do you keep coming back to that you keep wanting to do it you just can't let go of it or get it out of your mind these are just a partial list but it should give you an idea when you're having negative reactions and feelings events don't justify the feelings or their level there's a strong possibility Satan has already gained a foothold in your home and or your family. Prayer is your best defense against the enemy. You don't need to sprinkle the water, burn sage to clean your home. Again, these are pagan practices that are ineffective against satanic forces, and they will pretend that they work just to get you to not drive them out. Jesus is your authority. So ask Jesus for the authority to have the ability to cast out the demons. You pray in Jesus' name. You don't let the enemy teach you how to fight him. There's all these things in Hollywood, there's all these movies and books, and they all give you different ways to fight the enemy, and they are all garbage. You fight the enemy through prayer. Satan will give you false things to play with, they will set you up to fail. So let God show you how to fight the enemy and to win. It could be you've done nothing to allow these forces into your home. You may have moved into a home that had previous owners who did such things. When we moved into the Simi Valley, that apartment complex, that whole area had pre-existing demonic forces there. And as a result, once you become aware, you then start the battle. So you could be in a neighborhood that has demonic activity. We moved into a brand new home in Simi Valley, my parents did, and there was heavy demonic activity in there. For lack of a better description, it was a haunted house, although there had been nobody living there before us. And when my mother passed, her ghost, quote unquote, crept showing up, coming into the house, doing things in the house, and my brother and father encouraged it. When I wrote a book that my father had put together, The Ghost of Beach Not Hollow, I got a little message on my Facebook. It just said 1004. Yeah, but I was looking at me funny. I knew what that was. I said, are you telling me that you lived at 1004 Appleton? No, I lived across the street from you. And I watched all these things happening in your house. And we had a little old man that kept appearing in my closet 
all the time and trying to get me to do things. So I started asking around and people that had been there and there was more demonic activity than you could believe in that area. Something had happened in that valley probably a couple of hundred years ago that started all of this. So you could have done something without realizing that you're opening a door for them. So you could be watching something on television. You could be playing certain kinds of music. You can be having a discussion with people. You can be reading your horoscope. Any of those things will open the door. So there's a general cleansing prayer. <coughs> takes just a few minutes. So if that doesn't work, then I suggest we do a more deep down spiritual cleansing. So here is the general prayer that I'm suggesting you might want to go through and pray. Dear Jesus, hit the button. <laughs> Dear Jesus, please bind the powers of Satan that have had no power, authority, or influence over, and you can list the names of you and your family, your pets. Yes, you can pray for your pets as well. That's allowed. Mm -hmm. Or over our home. Bind the enemy and drive him out. Keep him out and let your Holy Spirit build a hedge of protection over us. Restore your peace to our home in Jesus' name. That is the acid test. Is there peace in your home? Are you at peace? Can you relax? Can you rest? Or are you always being agitated? So if God's peace is not restored, you may need to do the deep down spiritual cleansing. So again, if you're married, have your spouse join you. If you have children, make it a family thing. Teach your children how to fight the enemy. <clears throat> he's the ultimate legalist, and he's going to be looking for some legal loophole to avoid leaving. Mm -hmm. So the one with the legal authority needs to be the one who does the cleansing. So the owners, the person paying the rent, whatever it might be, be very specific in your prayers and what you are asking for. You have spiritual authority based upon several scenarios you're the owner or you're buying the home you rent the property or you rent the house you live there let's say that you're living in a room there and in this case you're going to be limited just to your living area the owner still has the final authority you've been asked to pray for the property again that's only good for a limited time it was interesting because we moved into a new office for the county and within a month and a half we had three people that had died we had all kinds of things that were going wrong one of the believers went to the boss and said can I have Dennis go through and pray for the office and she freaked out she was a believer it's like I don't want that I don't allow that no 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 and after several more things happened she finally says okay you can go through and pray for the office, but nobody else can be here, and nobody's supposed to know about it. So I came in on a Saturday. I went through and prayed for the entire office. I dedicated everything to God. I cleansed it spiritually. Nobody knew about it, but that Monday, all the things stopped. All the problems went away. So it's not as effective as the owner or the renter actually doing the praying. The enemy moves against you or against the family personally. So you're allowed to ask for protection in that case. My father was a Baptist minister. They asked Bev and I to house sit for a weekend. And when they were gone, we went over to relax. They had a pool table, they had a swimming pool, they had cable, and they had food. This was great, a whole weekend, and everything we wanted. And within 10 minutes, we were screaming and yelling and fighting at each other. We were like, whoa. How did that happen? So we went through as the house sitter and we prayed for the entire house, cleansed the entire house, and the peace came over so we could sit and relax and enjoy the pool table and the t cable and everything else. When my father and mother came back from the trip, they walked through the door griping, complaining, and criticizing everything, and with them came the negative demons because they were now back and we had lost our authority. We would pray for the room we lived in when we went over to visit them for our own protection. So do a deep spiritual cleansing. Begin with the general prayer in which you, first of all, 
call upon God in Jesus' name. You ask God to bind the enemy and revoke the authority that it's claiming over you. You ask God to guide you in the cleansing. You give everything over to God and ask his Holy Spirit to cleanse everything. Go room to room. We normally start in the bedroom because that's where we started our morning was in the bedroom. So we'd stand in the room and we would pray for those who are with you. You give the room and everything in it and all of it that's connected to it to God. We mentioned the bed, the dresser, the mirror, the closet, the clothes, the shoes, the end tables, the lights, the curtains, everything. Because Satan is a legalist. If you miss something, he's going to claim, well, they didn't say it that they couldn't hang out in the curtains. Ask Jesus and the Holy Spirit to cleanse and anoint everything in the room and list the various items. Then you go from uh, room to room and you can do things like, you know, God, this is where we start the day. I like to meet you when I get up every morning and have you standing here to say hi. Or this is where I finish my day and I'm going to sleep at night. I like to have you here and kind of watch over me as I'm going to sleep. So again, ask God to be with you and finish the day. It's a place of fellowship. Ask God to protect us, that people can't come in who would not be of him, that you would not be watching things you should not be watching, you would not be talking about things you should not be talking about. And when you've completed giving the property to God, and again, don't forget the hallways, the closets, the doors, the bathrooms, the sheds, the attics, the yards. Satan is a legalist, and he'll claim whatever he can. Make sure you do an all-inclusive closing prayer. So here's an example. Dear Jesus, it is our intention to give everything we have authority over to God. If we missed anything, please include it in this prayer. If there's anything Satan is trying to cling to in order to stay, revoke his authority and drive him out in Jesus' name. And I would suggest one final prayer. If there's anything in our possession that you do not want us to have, or if anything is giving Satan authority to stay or return here, please show us what it is and take it away from here in Jesus' name. We prayed that on the first spiritual cleansing. <laughs> Next day I put in our 8-track tape of Jesus Christ Superstar, and the machine instantly ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> So again, if you pray for a CD or a DVD and they're acting up, don't try to fix them or replace them. Get rid of them. God is trying to tell you something. Be aware that Satan will continue to try it again. Pay attention to the shows and movies you're watching, the music you're listening to, what you talk about when you're with people. If you're always being critical, if you're gossiping, if you're being negative, those open the door. For these forces to come back in. Even reading your horoscope can open the door. So if you feel the peace of God leave, or something makes you uncomfortable or uneasy, play it safe. Pray once more until God restores the peace. So part of this class is doing an exorcism and discussion. Again, I want to be very careful about that. You know, not everybody is going to be possessed. They could be mentally disturbed. So uh, give me a few minutes. I know we started late and I'm running late, but I want to get this covered if you guys don't mind. If somebody does have to leave, I'll understand. Let's take a look at how demons were cast out in the Bible. Demon is not in the King James Bible. They are always referred to as evil spirits, unclean spirits, or devils. There's no discussion of evil spirits or demons in the Old Testament. We don't even see anybody being possessed in the Old Testament. I find that very unusual. I'm still trying to figure out why. <laughs> there was no casting out of demons in the Old Testament. There was a reference to unclean spirits in just one passage. It's in the book of Zechariah. And it's interesting is this prophecy is that God is going to remove unclean spirits at some point in the future. Zechariah 13, 2. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I will cause the prophet and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So this seems to be a future event, and I suspect that when we have the millennium, God is going to remove all the demonic forces from the earth along with the fallen angels. 
So it's going to remove them. What we see in the Old Testament is a reference to devils that are posing as false gods. Deuteronomy 32, 17. People sacrifice their children to devils. Psalm 106, 37. This is how people believed in the false gods. They could have been the demons or the fallen angels making themselves revealed. So we're going to discuss demonic possession. We're going to discuss casting out or exorcism. Again, Catholic Church is the one that does the exorcisms. I've used that term and people have gotten upset with me or they felt it was not right. So I'll say casting out if it makes them happy. Same thing. Uh, we need to point out that a Christian cannot be possessed. The Holy Spirit's within us and Satan and demons cannot enter. So let's see how evil spirits were cast out in the New Testament. Matthew 4.17, people brought, were brought to Jesus and Jesus was the one that cast out the demons. We don't see anyone else casting out evil spirits, devils, or demons until Jesus sent his disciples forth. Mark 3, 14 through 15, he ordained the 12 that they should be with him, that they would send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. You get the authority from Jesus. So unless you have this authority from Jesus, don't go looking for the demons. I believe if God brings a demon into your life, he is giving you the authority over it. But again, please don't go looking for them. We can only have authority over demons when it's given to us by Jesus Christ. Acts 19, 13 through 16. I love this story. Certain of the vagabond, that's kind of a low-life Jew, exorcist, took upon them to call over those who had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and the chief priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So we learned several things from this account. Only believers can cast out demons or perform the exorcism. It's not safe to cast out demons. Demon-possessed people can have supernatural strength. The person we were trying to exercise or deliver or cast out the demons, I was literally having his arms pinned down, leaning my full weight on his arms. And my roommate had his legs up off the ground and he was literally lifting me and my roommate back and forth throughout the entire exorcism <laughs> or casting out. <clears throat> also know that demons know who Jesus is. They also know those who serve Jesus. They can humiliate and inflict bodily harm on those seeking to perform an exorcism or a casting out. When you've been authorized by Jesus to cast out demons, they must obey. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Even the devils are subject to us through your name. If they're not obeying, something is wrong. Either you do not have that authority, or you have some sin in your life that might be hindering. So you need to make sure that your relationship with Jesus is up to par before you start any of this. Or like your friend, he didn't want to be. Or he didn't want to be. Yeah. Two specific accounts of people casting out demons we need to look at. Mark 3, Mark 9, 38. John answered and said unto him, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he followed us not. And we forbade him because he did not follow us. So we don't know how this person was able to cast out Case out. That's cast out. Demons in Jesus' name. We don't have enough information to make that decision, but we know two things. He was doing it in the name of Jesus, and he was successful. So I'm going to assume he did believe, just wasn't part of the 12. Mm -hmm. The secret might lie in Jesus' response, 39 through 40. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that shall speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. 
So Jesus saw him as being part of the work. Again, we're not sure how, but God granted him that authority. And in Matthew 7, 22 through 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. So how is this possible? Well, the rabbis had a theory from Matthew 12, 24. The Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow, speaking of Jesus, casts out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Now that's when Jesus said that if Satan is casting out Satan, his house is divided. But, in this passage of those casting out demons, in Jesus' name, he did not know them. So in that situation, I'm going to suggest that what was happening is Satan was having his forces leave those who were possessed in order to deceive them. Remember, they were never a believer. You know, Jesus never knew them. It's not that he used to know them and they fell away. They were never one of his. They had to be deceived into thinking they were part of Jesus' family, even though they were not. And so I think we're talking about a member of the cult. And so I think in that case, Satan allows the actions in order to further deceive them. And when they called out the name of Jesus, the demon did not have to obey but Satan had them leave just to deceive that believer. Do you think they were thinking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees too? Uh, kind of? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know exactly were, how they were doing it. I wish I had some biblical examples, but we don't have anything to work with. No, not that they were giving out demons. That he was talking to them to say because you know they're hypocrites and they weren't really. Okay, so we do learn from Scripture that Jesus did recognize the ability of the Jewish priests to cast out demons, even though there was nothing specific concerning this in the law of Moses. Luke eleven nineteen, and if by Beelzebub above cast, if I by Beelzebub above cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? We also learn that there are different strengths among demons. Some are more resistant to exorcism or casting out. These require a different approach. Matthew 17, 19 through 21. This was the young boy who was possessed and the father was asking the disciples to cast out the demon and they could not. Mm -hmm. So the disciples came to Jesus and said, why could we not cast out the demon? And Jesus says, because of your unbelief. Also, this kind of thing does not go out but by prayer and fasting. Sometimes you need to be fasting to strengthen your spiritual uh, focus on God. In this account, we learn that some demons can resist our efforts to cast them out. We need to believe that God has given us the authority over them. And it appears that fasting again will increase your spiritual strength. We no longer fast as part of our spiritual walk or as part of our spiritual warfare. Giving up on something and taking that time to focus on prayer and Bible study can strengthen your faith. It is not increasing your spiritual strength. It is just making you more aware of the power of God within you. It will make you more receptive mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit. So you're not removing the demon by your power, but by the power of God. You need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and what he is telling you to do. As we noted previously, it's not safe to perform exorcisms. It carries a risk that you could be humiliated or injured. You need God's protection when you confront the demon. There's also a danger of the person who is possessed. Mark 9, 26. And the spirit cried and tore him and he came out of him. And he was as one dead. And so much that many says, oh, he's dead. There's another danger that if the demon is cast out, the person has not accepted Jesus as his or her savior afterwards. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rests and finds none. And he says, I will return to my house from where I came out. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and clean. It's all nice and neat, but Jesus is not living there. So he goes out and takes seven other evil spirits that are more wicked than himself. And they come in and dwell. 
And the last estate of that man is worse than the first. Uh, I know one person that uh, they had demonic possession. Somebody did a casting out over them. The demons left. They did not lead this person in a prayer of salvation. They just let them go. And the demons have come back. And this person is in much worse shape than before. <coughs> Not enough to cast the demon out. There must be something moving into that person who was delivered. And that would be Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If the person does not accept Jesus as their Savior, they run the risk of repossession. The guy that we were praying over in college, the guy that was not successful, uh, I believe a number of the demons did leave as we were calling and casting them out. I came back the following week from being home over the weekend and he says, guess what I did while you were gone? I go, what? I prayed to be repossessed. So he had more there than when we started. So you run the risk of repossession and they will be worse off than before. There are several other accounts of demonic possession in the New Testament. I want to cover them quickly. We have the man that was in Gennesaret, living among the tombs. He had supernatural strength. He would snap chains. He couldn't bind him. He was possessed with so many demons, they called themselves legion. Jesus was able to speak to the demons and sought their names. Again, they said that their name was legion, so he used that as power over them. Notice that demons did not give their name, so they called themselves legion. It's wise not to speak to the demons. You command them in the name of Jesus to come out, otherwise you're not speaking or making contact with them. Jesus sent the demons into swine, so be careful, because once demons are pulled out of a body, they will try to find some other place to go. Only believers should be involved in any casting out, otherwise people around you may have the misfortune of being possessed after them. You can bind the demons in Jesus' name. Jesus bound them to be silent and not to disclose who he was. They begin to hurt or possess somebody. You can bind them so they won't hurt. You can also bind them and command them to give you access to the demon-possessed person. Make sure the possessed person wants to be freed from the demons. No one burned sage. No one sprinkled holy water. And no one put a crucifix on them to exercise them. And these are gimmicks that Satan wants you to use to make you think you have power over the demons. We do not have power over the demons. It's not our rituals that give us power. It's the authority of Jesus and only Jesus that cast out demons. And then we have one last discussion. I'm going to stop the PowerPoint at this point and just kind of run it through. Ghosts. People are deceived into thinking that they are talking to their loved ones. As we are growing up, there are demons and in, in the fallen angels around us at all times. They see what we're doing. They know what we're talking about. They know what somebody tells us. So when they go to a medium, the medium is talking to a demon that knows everything about your loved one, and they can perform their seance and sound and look just like your loved ones. You have people that have ghosts coming into their house that manifest themselves to look like their loved ones. And because you think they are your loved ones, you allow them to come in. We have what's called the poltergeist. These are the spirits that move things. These would not be demons because they cannot touch things. They have disembodied spirits. But these would probably be the fallen angels working in connection with them to move things around the house to touch things, to give a presence of a physical presence. These are all things that Satan is doing, trying to deceive you and to make you think that you're talking to a loved one so that you will not let them go away. You won't ask them to go away. You will not bind them. You want them in your life and they are free. Only once did somebody contact somebody real and that was the witch of Endor and she contacted the spirit of Samuel and the spirit of Samuel came from the bosom of Abraham to give God's message and judgment to King Saul for doing this. Do not talk to the dead. Do not go to seances. 
do not use Ouija boards. Stay away because you're opening yourself up to the influence of Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna close this in prayer for right now. I'm gonna let everything keep running. I'm gonna expand the camera for our discussion, but I wanna kinda of get to the end of this for those that might need to leave or something. Heavenly Father, thank you for this information. Father, let us learn from these examples. <clears throat> Teach us how to fight the spiritual war. Make us prayer warriors. Make us effective warriors in your army, Father. We ask that you would give us the power and the authority over the demonic forces. That, Father, you would give us the wisdom of how to use your word and how to confront them in Jesus' name. Should we be forced to encounter them, we ask for your victory in all things. Mm -hmm. Father, until such a time, we ask for your divine protection. Don't let us go looking for demonic forces. Don't let us dabble in these things or play with these things. Keep us secure in your Holy Spirit. And keep us away from the forces of Satan until such time as you bring us against them for a spiritual battle that you have given us the victory ahead of time. Now watch over us, lead us and guide us in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I am going to... Open this up so it has more of the people. The ones in the back I can't get because you're the back row. You got my hand? Uh, nope. Good. I have John and I have Ruby and I've got Kay and Faye and me. But, okay, let's open this. Yeah. Well, we could turn the camera if we needed to, but I got the screen as wide as it goes. That's the full screen. Well, you can move up here if you want to be in the camera. Oh, we're going to what? We're going to have a dis debate, discussion. Oh, okay. Ask questions. I wanted it to be on camera in case. Because okay. we had a really good one last time. So. Okay. Okay, hold on. Yes, I am lifting a purse on camera. I have performed a supernatural event. <laughs> 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 um, I have a question. Yes. Um, Jesus maybe throughout the discussion i think you'll answer them most, okay. most of the time he, he goes before i ever even um one of them is with uh you were defining the, the distinction between where a non-believer goes and where the believer goes when they die, they die. <coughs> and uh for, for clarification um uh, which one goes where and for what reason if a person was a believer pre-crucifixion and these would be not just the Jews they would also be Gentiles the bosom of Abraham was the waiting place for those that died waiting for the Messiah and the picture of this in the uh, law of Moses was the city of refuge and the city of refuge was available to Gentiles and to Jews both and if they had killed somebody by accident, they would be allowed to stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. So, believers, Jew and Gentile, before the crucifixion, when they died, they would go into the bosom of Abraham. We see this with the parable or the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus went into the bosom of Abraham. With the death of the high priest, i.e. Jesus, the people in the city of refuge are free to go home in the case of the bosom of abraham they were now free to go into heaven because the issue of sin had been resolved so the bosom of abraham was a pre-heaven and sheol is still the place of torment for the non-believer does that answer your question yeah um and then continuation for that for the wait the for Part the two. okay Oh, it's still in the first one. But the great white throne is where the non-believer um, follows underneath the law of Moses under uh, judgment? Yes. At the great white throne judgment, according to Revelation, the dead that are in the grave and in the sea and in hell shall be brought up. This would be all the non-believers. And they will stand before God. The books will be open. And at the great white throne judgment, they will be judged according to the law of Moses. Now, basically, this is going to be their sentencing. When they die, God made the decision, Are your, is your name written in the book of life or not? 
And if not, you're going over to Sheol or the hell to wait for the sentencing. And they will then end up before God at the great white throne. God will give them the chance to present any defense that they want. All the books will be open for their review and they can find any evidence they want to use to argue that, oh, you missed me. I did ask for salvation and you just forgot to write it down. Not very likely. But at the end, they will then be sentenced to the great white and to the lake of fire. And they're using the law of Moses there. Over at the Bema seat, these are the believers. And this is where Jesus is. And this is where your rewards are being judged. Your eternal security is not in jeopardy. It has already been determined. Now we're deciding, are you going to be given rewards or not for the things you did? And each of your rewards is going to be judged based upon the motivation behind them. And so you have wood, hay, and stubble. These were things you did for the wrong reasons, for personal gain or personal glory. And if it is something that you did for God, then that becomes silver, gold, and precious stones. And the fire will be applied, and whatever is left is what you'll be given as your reward when you enter heaven. And there are some that everything will be lost, and they will, lose, they will suffer loss, but they themselves will not be lost. They still will be admitted into the new heaven and the new earth. That's that's one. That's one. Yeah, that's one. But okay. Great okay. Yeah, um, and we did it correctly. You filled in what I what I. Well, I did missing. it correctly. Okay. Well, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hey, when I said I that, I, I was mean, being judged. No, no, no. Okay. This is not the right room. I was going by the notes <laughs> and whatever was not filled in. That's what I meant. Okay. Because uh, what I was missing. Just making sure I'm not on the front of the great white room. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, um. I think the other portion was, um, and this is to your, however you want to answer it. Uh oh. Um, in your response, I uh, you stated, I burned everything I had collected, and I burned all my research, and I find that beautiful. That that's where you started, and you had to acknowledge that, and that was, um, this is where you can correct me. Um, this is according to your sensitivity of following God's conviction or God's wanting you to, to throw everything away and that's the beginning of it. It was actually pure terror because <laughs> when you encounter, I don't know if it was a demon or if it was a fallen angel but it was terrifying, it was frightening all my peace was gone instantly I was overwhelmed by terror, fear and I grabbed everything and I ran out just to get rid of it and it wasn't until I got rid of it that the terror left and God's peace came back upon me Again, I don't recommend recommend this for anybody. Learn from my mistake. Okay, any other questions or comments or things we want to talk about? Since Christians know the power of Satan, um, you would think that that would be something that you'd get into, you know, unless you got deceived about it, that you would even have the tarot cards or go to a palm reader or any of that stuff. Because that just, like I said, that invites that spirit in. So it's kind of, but I didn't know about the horoscope. This was back in the 70s. I didn't go by it and live by, oh, it told me so-and-so today, but I did read it until I, until someone said that you that's not good. So, of course, I stopped it, but it wasn't that I was living my life according to what, you know, have a good day, whatever kind of stuff. But um, People can be deceived that that's it's, what I'm that saying, it's that God. Yeah. That it's God that's directing yeah. what you're seeing there. He is the deceiver, and I think I might have shared this before, but, um, you know, he's not creative. Satan's not creative. He's, 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 he does the same stuff, and yeah. he knows us, and so it just, he's, someone mentioned it, like, all he does is, like, like take the gift, and then he, and here's the same thing. He tricked you before with it. He tricked you before. Now he's doing it again. We should be, like, white bulb, but no, he, he put a new bow on it. He puts a glitter. He puts something different. So, but it's still the same thing. You got tricked before. Mm -hmm. But see, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and I think the secret is in your comment that Christians should know the power of Satan. But again, there's a lot of people out there that you know fell for the boast. No one believes me anymore. Right. I'm not really here. 
And so they don't think in terms of a spiritual war. They do not think in terms of demonic activity. Uh, I mean, when you see somebody that is demonically possessed, it will terrify you. And in each case, whenever I've dealt with somebody, there are certain things that I, I look for because one of those things is that if this person knows things that they could not know mm. from natural means, like when the demon began accusing that guy of what was going on in his room behind closed doors, then you 